Welcome to the day. It's being billed as the trial that could totally reshape the tech industry and shake the hole that many big tech companies have on their customers. An antitrust trial against Google opened in Washington, D.C. today. Prosecutors allege the company illegally made itself the default app on many devices and services, crushing its competitors in the process. Lawyers for both sides have made opening statements in a trial that's expected to last 10 weeks. It's the first time in a quarter of a century that a tech company has faced antitrust law in the US. The last time was when Microsoft was prosecuted over the dominance of its Internet Explorer browser. Google denies the accusations and says its products uh, succeed simply because they're the best on the market. Well, let's pick this up with Jennifer Huddleston, who's a technology policy research fellow at the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C. Welcome to DW. Um, so this is a, a federal case brought by the uh, Justice Department. Why are they going after Google? I think that's actually a really good question at the, it, when we're looking at this case. Why are we seeing the American government go after an incredibly successful American company, a company that's very popular with consumers? What the government, um, and this case is brought by the Department of Justice, It's also there's also a, a companion case brought by the attorneys general of several different states are arguing is that Google has not only obtained monopoly power, but that it's using that monopoly power in anti-competitive ways or maintaining that monopoly power in anti-competitive ways, such as by making itself the, the default search engine or through what it's doing in the search engine advertising market. What's interesting though is this is a company that's incredibly popular with consumer and much of it's much of, of what's going on here is actually a question of should consumers be the one to decide what products are successful in the market or is there a government intervention to dictate what the market and search should look like? So because the, the, the sort of motivations do seem a little bit uh, cloudy there, is this, could we see this really as just a sideways way of tra trying to break up this enormous uh, company, like uh, taking down Al Capone for not paying his taxes? We certainly have seen a lot of scrutiny of big tech companies, of these leading tech companies that are largely American um, on both sides of the Atlantic, actually. We've seen a lot of scrutiny from European regulators. But interestingly, we're also seeing a lot of scrutiny from U.S. regulators on both the left and the right. This is probably a result of various political motivations that, that vary depending on whether you're looking at it on the left or the right. But also it represents a, a pretty dramatic shift in the way that we've seen competition policy used in the U.S. And what I see as a very concerning shift away from something that's truly focused on the consumers and how the competitive markets are, are benefiting consumers or how anti-competitive behavior may be harming consumers to something that's much more focused on kind of the idea of concentration in and of itself as a harm, the idea that competition policies should be focused more on competitors than on the outcomes that are best for consumers. So what do you think the outcome of this trial is likely to be? Can you see Google being broken up or, or perhaps just getting its wings clipped? really interesting questions in this particular trial is what happens even if the government wins? What would what would that look like in terms of a, a remedy? Because it's not necessarily obvious that there there is a, a potential regulatory remedy there. Or if so, when you stop and think about them, they are so anti-consumer that it's really concerning what those remedies would look like. The idea that when you opened a web browser, there would be no default search engine. It would either have to just be random or you would have to go through additional steps to select a, a search engine when that's something that consumers have largely come to expect. The fact that this could change the advertising market when ads have prices have generally fallen in ways that have incredibly benefited small businesses who are now able to advertise online much more easily 
than in an era where you had to purchase television advertising or print advertising. But I think the other really interesting question here is what does this do to the innovation that's going on in search itself? Um, what does it do in terms of the developments we're seeing in AI, the shifts we're seeing to how Gen Z is, is searching completely differently and things like voice recognition? And then finally, what does it mean when it comes to what competition policy is being used for? What would this mean in terms of how we would see regulators, particularly in the U.S., potentially pursuing antitrust cases in the future? Right. Just on, on the, the, the first of the, the many points you made there, you make it sound um, like quite a complicated uh, business and uh, of changing your, your uh, search provider. And Google's defense, and certainly when I've uh, used... Um, uh, my phone or the, the computer, is that, no, it's really easy to change uh, search uh, engines. That's surely not a huge uh, burden on the consumer. Well, it is very easy to change search engines right now. It's only four clicks away on your typical smartphone. But most people expect that there is a preset search engine, that you're not opening a phone out of the box with nothing pre-installed in it, that there's one and then you can, can change it if you don't like that one or want to go to another one. I think that's some of the question here too, is should the government be dictating what these business relationships can look like and what products you're offering to consumers when something comes out of the box? Interestingly, uh, on this side of the Atlantic, as you, as you hinted at earlier, um, that the European Union has just uh, introduced legislative control of big tech with its Digital Markets Act, uh, designating uh, Alphabet, that's Google's parent company, and Amazon, Apple, ByteDance, TikTok's owners, uh, and uh, Meta, um, the owners of Facebook, and Microsoft as gatekeepers who will have now six months to ensure full compliance with these new laws. And can you see that being successful and something that the, UK, that the US is likely to uh, look at and try to adopt? It's very interesting to see this dynamic emerge between the EU and US regulators. And I think it's very concerning to see how many Amer leading American tech companies have really appeared to be the, the target of, of this kind of regulation that seems very specifically designed to go after not general practices, but those particular companies. These are leading innovative companies and we're seeing them continue to compete not only amongst each other, but against a, any number of emerging players, whether it's in AI or whether it's through the development of new social media or whether it's through things um, in any wide array of, of markets and industry. So when we see something like a regulatory framework in the DMA, I really have questions about what that's going to do for the future of innovation. And again, is it really the role of government re regulators to dictate what consumers should have access to in the market when we are continuing to see that this remains a competitive and innovative market? So why then do you think that the US uh, Congress, which has considered this issue many a time, uh, failed to rein in what have been called these anti-competitive uh, practices uh, of these companies? I don't think it's a, a failure. I think that the proposals we've seen are very concerning in the way that they shift the focus away from, from the consumer. The proposals we've seen in the, the U.S. Congress would actually largely harm consumers in the way that it would prevent them from having certain features that they've come to expect and accept. The ability to, you know, when you Google, find me the nearest uh, hamburger restaurant, that a map pops up with the, the list of the hamburger restaurants that are, are nearby, or the way that when you are trying to find out more information or, or reviews about a place that you have several different options, including those options that may be built into a service, but you can also very easily go to other services if you don't like right. the options that are, are available in, in Google. And so when we're seeing these regulations come in, what they're telling companies is we think we know you think you know what your consumer wants, but we know better. And rather than let you be popular by serving your consumers, we're going to dictate so that we can make sure that your competitors 
have have the same advantages that you have. So if you're more innovative, if you're more successful, if you're providing more popular services, we're going to try and, and regulate that in a way to 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 make the the product go down a level rather than allowing the market competition to raise everything up a level. It's a quick word about uh, money, because, of course, the, the, the big suspicion uh, has been that one of the reasons that big tech has been so successful at avoiding uh, legislative oversight in the US is the more than $250 million they've spent on lobbyists, uh, advertising and PR companies, as well as political uh, donations. Uh, can you see them being able to spend their way out of this corner? something that I'm really able to, to speak on. What I will point out is that we continue to see a debate over antitrust and that it's important that we recognize the value of the existing antitrust framework, which is objective and flexible and economically sound to deal with a wide array of industries and that we recognize that any changes to antitrust law, even if they may be nominally directed at big tech companies are likely to impact the market far more generally. Good talking to you. Thank you for taking us through that so clearly. Jennifer Huddleston from the Cato Institute.